as natural winemakers say, let the wine make itself. What's happening in commercial wines is you've got all kinds of alterations, additions, sometimes subtractions, and just heavy processes that create a winemaking style commercially that appeals to what has now become a global palate that wants sweeter, bolder, bigger, heavier, richer. Human OS. Learn. Master. Achieve. Todd White, welcome to Human OS Radio. Thanks for joining us. Oh man, Dan, I am super excited to be on your show today and have lots to talk about, including how to drink healthier wines. I have been interested in the subject of the effects of wine on health. Is it good for you? Is it not good for you? And when I was exposed to what you guys do, a lot of things started to click, but give us a little bit of background about you first. Well, I've been a serial entrepreneur since I was 17. I became a biohacker probably about a decade ago and always experimenting with fitness programs and better ways to eat, but became a pretty serious biohacker in the last 10 years and really serious in the last five years, meaning employing all kinds of optimizations to the life experience, including ketogenic diet. As a result of that, and as a result of tuning up my nutritional programming, in conjunction with what has happened in the wine world, I found that I couldn't drink standard wines anymore. They were making me sick and causing terrific brain fog and hangovers and same effects that many people have. And I think that it was attributed to both the tightening of my nutritional programming, getting completely off of sugar, as an example, and most commercial wines are filled with sugar. Mm -hmm. And then second of all, and in conjunction with what's happened in the wine industry. So wines in the last 30 years have reflected largely what's happened in the rest of agribusiness. It's been mass consolidation, and these wines are made in massive factories, and they're filled with additives. Mm -hmm. And so we saw a better, healthier way to drink. I've been a wine lover my entire life. But just couldn't drink standard wines anymore. And so just kind of stumbled quite by accident upon these natural wines. Uh, you would think all wines are natural. And we can talk about why they're not but and what makes these wines unique. So anyway, it was kind of scratching my own itch. Mm -hmm. Since then, we launched the business and endorsed by over 100 national health leaders because we've taken this fanatical health approach to wine. Mm -hmm. Initially, you'd ask, is wine healthy or not healthy? Well, that depends on what you drink and how much of it you drink as yep. to whether it's healthy or not. So there's a ton of studies showing that red wine in particular because of the nearly 800 polyphenols contained in red wine and polyphenols find their way into wine primarily from the skins and seed. And so with white wine, white wine is just a free run juice. Red wine gets its color from contact with the skins and hence that's where most of the polyphenols come from. We see big wine, if you will, has followed a similar path as big food in a lot of ways. There's lots of consolidation. There is manipulation of the end product towards more palatability, which people like to drink. And because of the strict protocol that you're using for your diet, you found that those wines were no longer tolerable. So you were looking for a better solution for your own diet and you stumbled upon these more natural wines and changed your life. When I discovered these wines, and this is, our wines are all naturally made, but it's a little deeper than that. We also only recommend that people drink low alcohol wines. Alcohol is toxic. And so the dosage really matters. So we have a number of criteria that all wines must meet in order to be represented by us. And there are only a few hundred winemakers in the world who make these wines, and most of them are in Europe. We do not sell any domestic wines. Interestingly, when you mentioned the consolidation that's happened both in food production as well as wine, a couple of interesting statistics. In domestic wine, 52% of all the wines manufactured in the United States are made by just three giant conglomerates. They hide behind thousands of labels and brands to confuse the consumer, mm -hmm. to have consumers believe that they're drinking from a chateau or a farmhouse. So my uncle, he's been the cellar master for Kendall Jackson and for Behringer, and he works for a smaller wine manufacturer, Peshmel now. But I've got to see some of the behind-the-scenes operations. And so oftentimes, if you go up to Napa Valley, you go to a tasting room that is designed to look like more of an old-world experience or something that's really sensorially appealing. But then you go across the street. It's where the wine is actually made. Big steel barrels. It's a major operation. It's totally disconnect between what they want the customer to feel and then where the wine is actually made. Right. So you sell wine through romance and stories. That is how wine is sold. Yeah. Look, there are 76 additives approved by the FDA for the use in winemaking. Now, most consumers don't know that. 
And hmm. the reason they don't know about these additives is because it's the wine industry's dirty, dark secret. And how they keep it secret is in conspiring with the government using tens of millions of dollars of lobby money, they have kept contents label off of wine. So wine is the only major food group without a contents label on it. Are these things like dyes? Well, there are 76 of them. They're anything from ammonia phosphate to coloring agents to Mm -hmm. body agents to give wine texture to fish bladders and egg whites. And here's the thing. You can't sell a wine to Whole Foods and be a small natural wine because you don't make enough volume. Right. They just won't even talk to you. So they only sell these kind of massive factory products, even though, again, it's possible that they're organic but that still doesn't have any real impact on the chemicals being used in the cellar, in the winemaking process. Mm -hmm. So it can be confusing for consumers when they see a wine that's, quote, organic. There are very few of those, but even if they do see one, that doesn't mean the wine is clean. That just means that the farming practices were chemical-free. Interesting. Yeah, so it doesn't mean that the winemaking process was clean at all. Again, similar to what we see with food in our world, in order to ensure reliability of the supply chain to consistency of being able to deliver the products, even shelf stability, probably not as relevant in this case since it gets better with age to a certain extent. But we see some of the same conditions here. Tell us about the wines that you seek out. What makes them interesting, unique, special, and how are they different? Yeah, I'll tell you exactly. Let me mention to you about the ageability on wine, just so that everybody understands this point. 92% of all wines purchased are drank within 24 hours of purchase. Right? Really? <laughs> yeah. I mean, most people are not aging their wine. They're buying it and drinking it immediately. So those are just consumer facts. But there are some folks who buy wine for ageability, but it's a very, very small audience. But let me tell you how these wines are different. So these wines are known categorically as natural wines. And so if your audience goes online and searches the term natural wines, they're going to find that there is a specific category of wines called natural wines. And what that means very specifically is that natural wines wines are dry farmed. That means that there is no irrigation use in their farming. They are chemically free farmed or meaning that they're organic or biodynamic. And biodynamic is a prescriptive advancement of organic farming. Mm -hmm. They are fermented with native yeast Mm -hmm. that are indigenous to the vineyard in which the grapes are farmed. So all grapes have native yeast on their skin. If you just pick a right bunch of grape off of a vine and you throw it in a bucket, the skins will break. Sugar from the grape juice will come in contact with the yeast and it'll start Mm. fermenting right there in the buckets. You don't have to do a thing to it because there are yeast on the skin of the grape that will create a natural fermentation. So in natural winemaking, all wines are fermented with those native yeast. Now, here's what's happening in commercial wines. And commercial wines Mm. are fermented with genetically modified commercial yeast. And the reason that winemakers use these commercial yeast is because they're much more predictable and much easier to work with than a native yeast, Mm. which is very temperamental and requires a lot of coddling. So in the fermentation process, if you have a broken fermentation or other problems during the fermentation process, it's at a high risk to the spoilage of the wine, meaning that it's then not sellable. Mm -hmm. So that's another reason why you can only make natural wines in these very small quantities. So you've got fermentation with native yeast. The next step is that Mm -hmm. there are no alterations, no additions or subtractions in the cellar. You've got a completely natural winemaking process. As natural winemakers say, let the wine make itself. What's happening in commercial wines is you've got all kinds of alterations, additions, sometimes subtractions, and just heavy processes that create a winemaking style commercially that appeals to what has now become a global palate that wants sweeter, bolder, bigger, heavier, richer. That's not what natural wine tastes like. That's not what real wine tastes like. Those are manipulated commercial products. So in the natural winemaking process, this is just natural. Nothing in, nothing out. And this is very unique. It's very hard. It's very risky for the winemaker. Therefore, there's only a few hundred winemakers in the world who follow these protocol. Dry Farm Wines, my company, is the largest reseller of natural wines in the world. And so in the United States, you can find natural wines in a few markets, San Francisco, New York, Miami, a little tiny bit, Los Angeles. But most of the country is locked away from these wines because they don't sell. People don't understand what they are. The great news about that is that they're very affordable. 
Mm. Our wines average $22 a bottle, which is extremely Mm. affordable for a fine handcrafted wine product. So you guys don't make your own wines, but you find wine that is produced under this natural method that fit your criteria, and then you are a reseller of those wines. And because those are usually smaller batch, you are getting wines from these hundred manufacturers around the world, and then you're providing access to those in this subscription model that you have. That's right. We procure, we don't make wine. Mm-hmm. As I mentioned earlier, we do not sell any domestic wines because there are no domestic wines that meet our criteria. Let me touch on a few other points that makes Dry Farm Wines very unique. So we don't represent nor will we accept all natural wines. Just yeah. because a wine is naturally made doesn't mean it meets all of our criteria. We don't sell any wines over 12.5% alcohol. We do not sell any wines that contain more than a gram of sugar, which is statistically sugar-free at the serving level. So we don't sell anything that contains that all of our wines are less than a gram per liter. Mm. As a result, they're also carb-free. This appeals to the ketogenic and the low-carb community in a significant way. In fact, among the endorsements that we have is Dr. Dominic D'Agostino, who's the leading ketogenic researcher in the United States, endorses our product because it will not take you out of ketosis, which is a large appeal to us and much of our audience. Mm -hmm. So we do not accept natural wines with more than 70 parts per million of sulfur, which is known on the wine bottle as sulfites. We lab test every wine. Mm. So the protocol for getting into our program is that, first of all, you can't even submit a sample to us if you don't meet the criteria I've already described. So if you're not organically or biodynamically farmed, if you're not fermenting with native yeast, if you're not naturally made, we won't even look at your wine. Okay, that's step one. Right, so that's step one. Then we taste the wine. We reject about 60% of wines on taste. We just don't like the aesthetic. If we like the aesthetic, we then pull a lab sample, and we won't taste anything over 12.5% alcohol. So we're just not even seeing those wines. Then we pull a lab sample. We send the lab sample to a certified enologist who's looking for a whole bunch of criteria for us, including sugar, alcohol, mycotoxins, sulfur, which is added sulfites. And about 50% of the wines that we send to lab will get rejected on one of those criteria. Mm, So this is the reason our wines have a very consistent, no hangover, no brain fog, a very consistent, super clean buzz. The buzz quality is just lighter and more energized, in part because you don't have any sugar, in part because there are no additives, in part because the alcohol is just a little bit lower. Tell us about the alcohol content versus other wines. So what is a traditional range? What is the range that you guys see for the products that you offer? Well, categorically, the international standard that is called wine ranges from 7 to 24% alcohol. That is the international category of wine. We don't see wines below 9% that we think have a wine aesthetic. We don't buy anything over 12.5%. Most of the commercial wines are 145 to 17% alcohol. There are two reasons for that. The primary reason is it's a winemaking style, and the grapes are picked when they're sweeter later in the ripening process, primarily in the United States because the vines are irrigated. Mm-hmm. So this is a very important distinction. The name of our company is Dry Farm Wines. That's because irrigation is foundationally the beginning of the interruption of what we call nature's logic. So the moment you irrigate a grapevine, you have intervened with nature's logic. Grapevines have been living for some 10,000 years without irrigation. In fact, irrigation didn't come to grape farming in California, which is where most of the United States wine is made, until 1973. Mm. Now, the reason you irrigate a grapevine is to fill the berry with water. That causes it to weigh more, causes a greater yield, and grapes are sold by the ton. So corporate greed, greed in general, has driven an unhealthier product. Here's why. When you fill a grape berry with water via irrigation, it weighs more, but also dilutes the flavoring profile of the wine. Consequently, the grape has to get riper. Irrigation has a tremendous impact on the physiology of the ripening of the fruit. Mm. And so what happens is the fruit can't be picked until it's later and sweeter. Now, the higher the sugar is at the time of picking of a grape will determine the outcome in the alcohol level. Let me explain why that's true. Here's how you make wine. You take grape juice and you inoculate it with yeast. 
the yeast eats the sugar. When the yeast eats all the sugar, then the fermentation is complete. Well, the more sugar there is to eat, the more alcohol there is, because when the yeast eats the sugar, the byproduct of that is ethyl alcohol and carbon dioxide. So this is how wine is made. Consequently, the higher the sugar is in the berry at the time of picking will determine how high the alcohol level is. Mm. So our wines, which are dry farmed and have proper flavor development at lower sugars, consequently generally produce a lower alcohol wine. Interesting. The reason that's important is because alcohol is toxic and dosage matters. And so, you know, what we want is a lift and a gentle euphoria. I don't drink during the daytime and I don't recommend that other people do either, but we drink wine around the dinner table. Mm -hmm. What that wine does, what alcohol in the correct dosage does, is provide you with that gentle lift, that euphoria, a lowering of your vulnerability window. This is the reason that we kind of share and bond with people when we drink. And it promotes love. I think anytime we can do anything that promotes love in the world, this is a great thing. So this is the beauty of alcohol, that gentle lift. When we have expanded creative expression and remaining cognitively connected— However, the problem is when the alcohol dosage gets too high, which is the reason I don't drink spirits, when the alcohol dosage gets too high, we start to move away from cognitive connection and creative expression into the other side of the buzz, which is just not as attractive. It's certainly not as much fun and it's not as healthy. I think you're making some beautiful points here about the right dose in terms of the feeling of alcohol. And it's such a dynamic topic because from a health perspective, there is evidence that it can be health promoting, but the doses are a lot lower than what people will drink if you drink. So it's this complex subject where there is a health benefit that has been shown through various ways that we've looked at it. The ancient Greeks, they only drank their wine diluted and they believed that only barbarians would drink unmixed or undiluted wine and it would bring out a type of behavior that would cause mayhem. The more ancient way of drinking was really similar to how you're describing it. It's a lower alcohol content. It is mildly euphoric and it adds to connection, but it's not necessarily promoting wildness and total disconnect with yourself. Yeah, there's no question about it. Look, there are going to be glorious exceptions. I get drunk occasionally. It happens. But generally speaking, we know that excessive alcohol is poisonous. It can kill you. Many people die every year from alcohol poisoning, not generally from drinking wine, but it's a toxic topic. But here's the problem. And you mentioned this. The studies from these health benefits are showing are at moderate, moderate levels. Most people are not drinking that way. Here's why. Most of us, alcohol is a domino drug. Mm -hmm. So the more you drink, the more it pulls you in. Here's the reason it's important to drink an inherently lower alcohol wine product. is because most of us don't have a drink. Right. Most of us have several drinks. I included and including all of my friends. Nobody has a glass of wine, not even two. And so this is the reason that it's important. I'm going to drink throughout the night, and I want to enjoy that experience and that product throughout the night. That's the reason it's important to drink an all-natural, lower-alcohol, sugar-free product in order to optimize performance. Here's the other problem with commercial wines. The alcohol stated on a wine bottle, you might remember I mentioned earlier that we test for alcohol, even though the label says 12 and a half or below, we test for it anyway because by law, the label can be as much as a percent and a half different. So if a wine says it's 14 and a half percent on the label, you can be drinking 16 percent wine. And there's a huge difference between 12% and 16% in terms of effect it has on your health and your brain. Drinking a lower alcohol wine is the only way to get a healthy low alcohol product because the only two alcohol beverages below wine are ciders, which almost always filled with sugar, and beer. So beer and ciders are your two categories of low alcohol below wine. And I wouldn't recommend drinking either of them for reasons we don't have time to cover here. But anyway, so low alcohol wine is your best choice if you're going to have a low alcohol product. Anything that will create the experience of reward in the brain will reinforce the desire to want to continue to consume that product, whether that's marijuana, alcohol, palatable food. So you're right. If something gives you that light buzz, its ability to encourage usage that is unhealthy is present. 
Another really important point that you've made is the natural way that people will drink wine is a glass to maybe three per night. And so if those glasses tend to be higher in alcohol consumption and sugar, then you're adding a lot of additional calories. You're taking in quite a bit more alcohol. And if you're drinking anywhere close to bedtime and you're having higher alcohol consumption, you're also likely to impair your sleep. Alcohol is a central nervous system depressant. The first stage of central nervous system depression is excitation. So if you're drinking a little bit, it can actually disinhibit you, but eventually it can make you sleepy. What happens is that it lightens your sleep. That's the time when you want to get your deep sleep. So if that's lightening your sleep, even though it makes you go to bed, it's actually making you feel terrible in the morning. And so I would say drink early and having a lower alcohol wine is a big component to how you're going to feel the next day. Yeah, no question. I mean, I do 24 hour intermittent fasting. So I only eat once a day. So by design, I eat earlier in the day. I generally eat around six o'clock. So if you're going to drink, start earlier, meaning at dinner and always eat and stay hydrated. You've got to eat with any kind of alcohol. The other thing is when wines or alcohol contain sugar, there's a supercharged interaction between that sugar and alcohol that leads to a lot more brain fog and just general disconnection. Here's how you know that's true. If you drink a margarita, or you drink a shot of tequila, the difference in the effect of how that tequila will have on you is more negative if you drink the margarita than just the shot. Same thing in wine. Mm -hmm. And so we reject quite a few wines that we initially like the aesthetic that comes back and they have sugar in them. Even as a professional, I can't always taste it. And I can feel it. If I eat sugar, I can feel its effect on my brain. And I'll know immediately that wine has sugar in it if it's high enough. So you said that there's a gram per liter. How many liters are in a bottle of wine? Well, it's not a gram. We will accept anything up to a gram. And most of our wines are less than half a gram per liter. A liter, a standard wine bottle is 750 milliliters. Mm. And so a liter is a bottle and a third. So if you added another 250 milliliters, you would have a liter. So less than a gram of sugar per bottle. Like fraction, 0 0.1, 0 0.2. It's statistically sugar-free. That's for our wine. And that's not true of all natural wines either. That's true of the wines mm. that we test and accept. And the overconsumption and habitual consumption of sugar, we believe, is a cause of most chronic illnesses in our country. It's not a bad place to put focus to the degree that added sugars easily increase calorie intake and to the degree that excessive calorie intake is contributing significantly to the obesity epidemic, to the degree that the obesity epidemic has many related comorbidities and seems to be a inscrutable problem in our world today. And you're right, there are notable health experts that say that this is one of the biggest concerns for the planet is this public health concern. And sugar is something that is absolutely part of the discussion about particularly refined added sugars to products, make them more palatable, promote overeating, add a lot more calories. So for comparison, your wines have less than a gram of sugar per bottle. What's the range for sugars that are commercially manufactured? Uh, 20 times that amount, 15 to 30 grams a liter. Okay. These are not tests that we are run or promoting. These tests are available online. I mean, these comparisons of companies who've done testing and if your audience is interested in the topic that they do a search, one of the top searches will actually name brands. We don't name brands and are not interested in getting into that nonsense, but many common household name brands that your audience would know about are these tests have been published online. The other thing on domestic wines that interestingly, glyphosate has been outlawed in Europe. Glyphosate is the active chemical in Roundup. Roundup is the yeah. number one used herbicide in U.S. vineyards. Last year, a study was done from three California Appalachians. 100% of the wines tested had glyphosate present in them <laughs> from three Appalachians, both from organic and non-organic farms. The speculation is that the glyphosate is getting in the vine and in the fruit through irrigation because the way Roundup is applied in a vineyard is not the same way it's applied, say, in a wheat field. In wheat, it's flown, they spray it from above. In a vineyard, it's applied down at the ground level. And so this concept of having overspray from one farm to another, again, from a non-organic farm, overspraying to organic farm, is not really very feasible. It's not likely that that's happening that way. It's more likely that 
glyphosate is getting in the wine through irrigation. Also, the other thing is these biodiverse farmers, these kind of hippies, I mean, they don't make a lot of money because the wine's not expensive and they can't make a lot of it because of the techniques that they use. But they're just activists of the land and that have a philosophical approach to farming and how they think the world should be. And one of the things that they're concerned about and focused on are living soils. We know that living soils are filled with billions of organisms that have an effect on our microbiome and the far-reaching complexities of going back to nature and living by nature's logic, by the design of the planet in its whole form. All of these things are connected. I think it's just really important. But I'm always thinking to myself, you know, the hippies had it right, living according to the laws of nature. Nature's logic, yeah. How many people that drink wine that are listening investigate how much sugar and alcohol is in every bottle you drink? You usually look at the label, is it pretty? But in your case, if it's complying with rules you would like to adhere to, then you can drink working within some confines that you're comfortable with. And so you're kind of getting in the wine that you want to take in. We've made, for my company, Human OS, a course on the traditional Mediterranean diet, which I'm favorable towards because the evidence that supports its health is robust. A big part of that diet is moderate wine consumption. In the skins, we find anthocyanidins and still beans. Skins and seeds, we find catechins and proanthocyanidins and flavonoids. We know that these have a really potent effect on blood pressure regulation, and on sleep quality, cancer suppression, even clearing out senescent cells. Flavonoids are really powerful on that. So quercetins, apigenin, fisetins. As soon as I heard about your concept, I immediately thought the wine that they were drinking on Sardinia and Icaria, so the women would take in about 5 to 25 grams per day, men 10 to 50 was these dry farm wines. They're not drinking monocropped, additive, included wines. If we're thinking about the health attributes of this diet and this dietary pattern, we're really thinking about the wines that you're offering. You know, the unique thing about us, Dan, is we're the only health-quantified wine merchant in the world. And that's true because we are fanatical about our health and we're fanatical about what we drink. And we don't drink anything we don't sell. Yeah. We only drink what we sell. The fact is, this is not a marketing message. This is how we live. We got in this business because I discovered this process and I felt so much better. And I shared it with some friends and they were like, oh, wow, this is completely different than we shared it with more people. And it became a business. Yeah. So we're super fanatical. Listen, I want to make an offer to your audience to try our wines and we'll give them a bottle for a penny and they can find that offer. And I'm sure you'll make a note of this in your show notes, but they can find that offer at dryfarmwines.com forward slash human OS for a penny bottle. And if they like to follow us or look for us, we're all social media. We are Dry Farm Wines. And any way I can be of service to your audience, they can reach me at Todd, T-O-D-D, at dryfarmwines.com. I love businesses that arrive out of somebody finding a solution for a problem that they had and then having it grow because it's filling a need. What you guys have is providing a great service. It's been great to talk to you today and hear more about your perspective on the product. I have personally tried your wines and they taste terrific. They actually taste a little bit different. I really enjoy them. So I'm an advocate. Thank you again for coming onto the show and talking about what you do. Awesome, man. I really appreciate you having me on today and live healthy and live your best life. Thanks for listening and come visit us soon at humanos.me.